Hi, Blair. How are you? I am super fantabulous. <laughs> Did you pause because really well? you didn't know how to say that word <laughs> or because you were ready to lie? I don't know. And I'm actually short of caffeine, too. I'm doing real well, thanks. As my father would say, any better and I'd cancel my health insurance. <laughs> I'm not that good. I'm actually recovering from a cold. I'm not even 100%. But, As a um, Canadian, that's a very empty threat. <laughs> Let me just tell you that. I know, it is. Yeah. Most people don't get that joke up here. Yeah. yeah. Um, did I ask you how you are? No, but yeah, I don't think you really, let's, <laughs> yeah, nobody no. cares. Let's, let's just dive just, in. Yeah, let's go in. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about what keeps you up at night. You've got some fears that I think you've uncovered through all the work that you do with agency principals and owners of uh, expertise, expert businesses. Um, you've uncovered some common fears. I guess you have a list of five fears that we're going to talk about today. And these are the, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are the five fears that you, you see as uh, those things that are keeping agency principals or owners of other types of small businesses up at night. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, having worked with you know, 900 and some principals now, it's just like I keep seeing these things pop up and they're generally illogical. So I just started writing them down and and got five. There's probably more, but these are the five that seem to be swirling everywhere all the time. You've been at 900 some odd firms and holding for a while. Are you in semi-retirement or what? When are you going to hit the triple digits? Well, I'm nearly, I've nearly exhausted everybody that will work with me in the world. So I, <laughs> I think there's, there's maybe like four or five weeks left. So yeah, pretty yeah. soon I'll be done. <laughs> yeah. You'll hit a thousand and out. I'm yeah. out, baby. <laughs> and then you'll open that pizza shop. <clears throat> Um, oh, all right. The first first of the five fears on the list that keeps agency principals up at night, you've got losing the critical employee who finally lets me pull out of the day to day. Now, as somebody who's like transitioned in the last few years from a solo consulting practice to a business where I'm relying on uh, quite heavily on team members, I read that one and I just kind of like oh, clutch my heart a little bit because that's <laughs> yeah. uh, that's. Well, at the top of the list for a reason. The people are, you know, they're building their businesses and they figure, okay, so I've got to get some of these things off my plate. And they get the easy things off the plate, the low hanging fruit. And then, and they, they know that there's still some things left that they need to get rid of. They're not going to be able to hang on to them, but they're not easy to get rid of. And yet they're really important. And maybe that's managing client relationships. Often it's something like that, right? Or sometimes it's the creative, like creative director or something, but mm -hmm. usually it's managing client relationships. And so you, they're holding their breath and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yes, I found the person that's going to be able to let me concentrate on what I need to do to help me scale this business. The person comes in and everything is great at first. And you know, sometimes there there is no problem. There's no reason to fear. But other times, this person turns out to be not as qualified as you thought or a jerk or something like that. And at, in those times, you feel like your instincts tell you you need to pull the pin. You need to, like, reverse this. You need to get rid of them for whatever reason. But you're terrified of doing it because – it's taken you so long to get this off your plate. And it's, so it's this irrational fear. Like this is the first time I've ever been able to get this off my plate. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to get it done again. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to live with whatever I don't like about this person who has freed me up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're saying what that person is doing for you is so immense, uh, um, in reality, as well as in your in your mind, that it kind of covers over some sins. You let them get away with some things. Maybe it's performance right. in other areas. Maybe it's attitude, cultural fit, right? <clears throat> fraud and embezzlement, whatever it is. And then losing that. Uh, so you're saying it's the fear of losing that person is what keeps people up at night? It's the fear of going back to having to do those things that you finally got off your plate. So you, this person has helped you, but it comes with all kinds of baggage and you would let them go if it weren't for this fear that you, it'll take you too long to find the next person, the second person to help get this stuff off your plate. And so principals will live with this literally for two or three years because they, they've, you know, they haven't gone through multiple cycles of getting things off their plate and then finding somebody else who was just as qualified. That's new to them. The notion of finding great people is new to them. And so it terrifies them to sort of reverse that process early in, early on as they start to learn that. 
It sounds like you are seeing a pattern here of that first really valuable person or person who's valuable in this way that allows me to free myself up to do other higher level things is very often, and correct me if I'm just reading something into this, but it sounds like the pattern that is that that person is very often um, uh, poorly skilled or inadequate in other areas. Is that is yes, that a common occurrence? It is because we we don't know how to hire the more expensive people. You know, in the early days, you hire who you could afford and you sort of put up with the rest that came with it, the lack of qualifications or whatever, and you train them. You kind of like the fact that it was a blank slate. They can learn your bad habits, but yeah, they're your habits, so you're okay with that. And you just don't know what it means to hire somebody really expensive. And you have all of these you have all of these these pent up expectations about this expensive person, and so the divergence, you know, what that person is capable of, and your expectations are so widely apart that you, the first great person you hire typically doesn't work out. But hiring that first person, the process is what sets the expectations for the future. And you almost like you never want to be, you never want to be a principal's first expensive person. You want to let them get that out of their system and be the second or third. So what's your advice to the principal or business owner who has just lost that very person that you're talking about? I think, you know, whatever I say to them, I don't think matters too much at that point. I think what they should do is really uh, just touch base, have candid conversations with other principals that have been there, that were there several years ago and have gone through it just to give them some assurance that, yeah, it's you're going to find other great people. Don't worry about it. All right. The second fear on your list that keeps agency principals up at night is employees knowing how much I make. Right. And it's it's always the principals making a lot of money that are nervous about this. <laughs> it seems like yeah. the ones who aren't making much money are very open about it. And either because and, and they're just open at the beginning until they start making a lot of money or they're open just as a sort of a, a philosophy of choice. But the ones that are making a lot of money, they're they think that their employees will resent this. And the truth is that if you're working hard as a principal making a lot of money and if you have a good culture, your employees do not care how much money you make. If anything, they love it when you make a lot of money. I mean, they don't want you to flaunt it. Like I had a boss one time, <laughs> there was a layoff of about, this was a 30 person firm, I think something like that. And about six people were let go. And the next day he pulled in with his new red Corvette and parked <laughs> it in the front. Now that's not what I'm talking about. Right. But most principals, when they say a lot of money, they, they say that, and I kind of imagine what that is. And then I look at it and I'm saying to them, no, that's that's not really a lot of money. You ought to be making a lot more money than your highest paid person. And you shouldn't be nervous about that. It's 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 a really weird fear. I think the principals have this – there's this latent fear that employees will – I don't know what it is – resent them for making a lot of money. And they don't. Good employees don't. They love it. How far do you think this concept of open book management should go when it comes to – finances, what people make, what the principal makes, and even profit? Yeah, great question. I, I don't think we ought to hide it too much, except I don't think we ought to reveal what other people make. I don't think that's healthy. Uh, but I've tested this multiple times, like giving employees the option. So like on a whole, almost like a retreat day, we set up stations, like go to this station, learn about what we're planning in the future. Go to this station to learn about the finances. Go to this station to learn about some service offerings we're considering. Here's our past performance. Most of the time, employees don't care that much about the financial side of things. And there honestly is no connection that I've been able to see between more openness and better performance. So I think it just doesn't matter all that much. Hmm. Information should come with training because most folks don't have financial literacy. Most employees don't. So it's really – I think it's useful to be open with them to a fairly loose degree as long as you help, help them understand what it means. Do you think because the principal's compensation is made up of salary and profit, and you might add something else to that, but um, do you think um, that 
from firm to firm, it's a wise thing for the principal to be sharing the profit either as a percentage or total total uh, dollars? Sharing the information or the profit yeah. itself? No, sorry, the information. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, again, it's it's to me, it's like, I, I don't think, well, I should clarify, I don't think principals should tell employees what they make. I don't think that's useful, but I just wouldn't work too hard to hide it, especially from the higher level employees. And um, in terms of profit, I think it's fine to share that as well. I'm the the older I get, the more open I think principals should be, and the more open I want to be. I've I've often toyed with the idea of just posting my financials, mainly because I think you know there ought to be some connection between uh, success in the marketplace and to what degree you know your clients listen to you. Yeah, you and I have talked about this before in private conversations. The idea of why why would you take advice from a consultant who's not earning you know what you if not more than you then what w- certainly what you would expect a successful high level consultant to be earning right yeah um, yeah and you told th- me you were making eighty thousand dollars the other day and I was really <laughs> proud of you I was like That's yeah great. I, I yeah. meant that day <laughs> <laughs> touche okay you got me there the third fear on your list that keeps agency principals up at night is ungratefulness or this idea of being taken advantage of. Explain yourself, Mr. Baker. Well, because there is a certain personality type behind uh, principals um, who are successful, there's also a downside in that the traits that are common on the good side that make them successful, they share the same traits on the downside as well. And those are typically two, uh, primarily lack of control when they feel out of control or when they feel like they're being taken advantage of. And so it's useful to know that as a principal, what makes you successful is that is uh, comes with those two things. And so when you feel either or both of those rising, like you feel the red you know, rising to your ears, then just slap yourself, give yourself a dope slap and say, I'm probably overreacting here. And, you know, you can see this very frequently, like at Christmas time, when if if the principal gives out Christmas bonuses and it just kind of pisses them off the first year, it's a lot of fun to give these out. And after that, it just feels like they think it feels more like an entitlement and they don't enjoy the process and they feel like they're being taken advantage of. And it's just good for principals to recognize that that comes with the territory, that when they feel like they're being taken advantage of or feel out of control, to relax, take some deep breaths, give themselves a dope slap if necessary, and recognize that that's part of their personality and they need to manage that. Wow, that's that's really great advice. It's um, you know I can identify with both of those scenarios one more than the other. But the idea that come on, it's just you. It's not this isn't real per se. You just have a heightened kind of propensity right. to experience things this way. Yeah, exactly. I do remember working for a guy, um, an agency owner, many years ago now, and a few of us had gone out for a drink, and you know, I, I was sitting there thinking, and maybe somebody said to me, you know what? He, we, we always assume that because he owns the business, he's going to buy the drinks. I mean, of course, it's all expensive, but I thought, I'm just going to mm. buy, I'm going to buy drinks tonight. So he, he was shocked, absolutely mm. shocked. And I thought, you know, it's probably a little gesture that um, probably I felt like it went a long way just because, yeah. you know, who knows how many times there's that resentment of, of having to pick up the tab. That is a g- perfect example, because I'll bet you that most of the times he didn't He didn't mind picking up the tab, but he did feel this little tinge of, you know, I bet they expect me to do this every time. That's a great example of that. Item four, fear number four on your list of what keeps agency principals up at night, how we compare to other firms. Yeah, Uh, this comes up um, usually twice in every engagement, but particularly at one place. So I always start on-site engagements under the total business review with a, a benchmarking. And of course, built into this notion of benchmarking is is benchmarking yourself against something, against other firms. Mm-hmm. And so we talk quite a bit about where they measure up, like financially, utilization, employees, quality of the work, and so on. And, and it's fairly innocuous. We don't know each other all that well at this point. But after a couple, two, three, four days of working together very intimately, like talking very openly about anything, nothing's off off um, 
off the table, they'll right before I leave, they'll just say, okay, so of all, with all the firms you've worked with, how would you rate us? I mean, and I hate that question because I'm duty bound to be honest. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so what I do is kind of, if I, if I'm caught off guard, if I'm tired and haven't, haven't anticipated the question coming right away, then I'll, I'll just scurry around in my mind and think of something where they're really doing better. Like, um, you know, you're located in a really exciting city. No, I'm kidding. I don't say that. But <laughs> but there's there's just something how they just want to know. They don't care so much about how well they're doing. They care more about whether they're doing better than somebody else. It's just a really interesting phenomenon. I don't understand what's underneath that. But they do care more about being – like they might be in some really – they're both really slow, but – as long as I'm a little faster than you, I'm okay. It's just a weird sense. And I think it might come from the fact that so many firms are so poorly positioned that everybody is a competitor. If if these firms were better positioned in the marketplace, then they wouldn't be as – uh, I guess they wouldn't be as nervous about somebody moving into their space because their space would be very clearly defined. And so you you also find there's not as much openness. There's not as much sharing between firms. And so it's, it's a weird thing. It's just this competitiveness that I don't think other industries quite have. Yeah, that's interesting. And do you get the question about specifically about a firm's the quality of its creative product? Well, I get that very, very often. Yeah. And you know, I'm not sure I'm the best judge of that, but I'll tell people like, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's really, it's one of the best I've seen. It's like, I would, if I didn't, wasn't already working with, with a firm that I've worked with for years, I would love to work with you folks, or you're one of the top 10, <laughs> or I'd love to, I'd love to send, you know, I'd love to send referrals to you. So you're completely disingenuous about your response to this question. Oh, no, no, no. I meant like, I really do mean that. But then, then many, most of the time I'll say your work is good enough. That's what I'll say. I, yeah. it's, it's good enough. It's fine. It's not, I don't think it's remarkable. It's good enough. And then other times I'll say it looks, it, it really needs some help. Uh, it's, you could do better. I think that I learned that phrase from you. It's a, it's a friendlier phrase. You could do better or, uh, or maybe you shouldn't have somebody, you know, or looks at, no, that's all. That's all I say. I think some things a little meaner, but I never say anything mean. It's just, but I do think they need to know that it's good enough, but it doesn't matter all that much. You know, it's, it's clients don't notice that like they, yeah. like principals think they do. Yeah, and it, it, for sure some clients do, but I'm, you know, as somebody who's on the business development side of the equation, my pat response to that question is usually, and it's not pat because it's not true, it's largely true and applicable to most firms I talk to, um, I usually say, your, your creative is pretty good. You shouldn't win or lose business because of it. Hmm. Yeah. And that's the answer. And they go, oh, oh, okay. But, do, yeah. do, I mean, do they... Do they read between the lines there? Do they, are they just satisfied and move on? They're never satisfied, but I think the, uh, my, the, um, the point I'm trying to make is, is being communicated, and that's that don't, don't overstate the importance of the quality of the creative par- product, again, with the exception of some, of some clients. Right. Um, so I think that's usually communicated. I often, um, you know, in terms of the question, how do we measure up against other firms, I often reply with my two questions. I say, well, there, there are two questions um, that I always ask myself about my clients' businesses. The first is, would I want to own this business? Mm-hmm. And the second is, would I want to sell this business? Would I mm-hmm. want to be your business development person on the right. front lines? Right. And then I give them my honest answer to both of those questions, and they can do with that whatever they, whatever they will. Sometimes is the answer to one of those yes and the other one no? Or is it always both yes or both no? Yeah, I I can't think of any specific examples, and I've asked it dozens of times. But I do know there have been some yes and nos, not universal nos or universal right. yeses. Right. That's that's a very interesting way to look at it. I don't think of myself as a particularly good salesperson. So what I'm selling, I really need to feel like what I'm selling is special or different. Not this idea that I believe in it. I think that's just a ridiculous line. But that that there's that I that I'm, I'm selling something that's different. Give me something that's different and I, f- I feel like I can sell it and yeah. I would, would enjoy selling it. Yeah, good. 
Now, the last item on your list is uh, the, uh, of the fears that keep agency principals up at night is the perception that the firm is in trouble. So that's perception in the market or uh, among employees or competition. Is that what you're talking about? Here? Yeah. And uh, it would be true for all three of those, you know, like my competitors out there, my employees. Yeah, everybody. And it's interesting because there are some cases, quite a few cases, when – they should be doing something for the health of the business that could be interpreted as a an impending sign of failure. For instance, laying people off, mm-hmm. and or you know, there's just there's so many things that fall in that category. Or uh, like I don't I don't want to lay somebody off, so I'm going to take this work that I know we're not going to make any money on. At least it's cash. It's not profit, but at least it's cash. And so they make these – when in fact the truth leaks out eventually. And in our world now – and I'm not sure this would have been true 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. But in our world now, their authenticity is embraced and – there's also this sense that, listen, any good firm can go through a struggle. I mean, I've gone through it myself. I, you remember I called you and and asked if I could meet with you because I was like lost. Every business can go through that and it's natural. And if we don't acknowledge some of the struggles we have every once in a while with the right people, we don't put it on the front page of our website, but – with the right people, then the, we're just not we're just simply not being authentic. And I think that the marketplace that these firms operate in value authenticity, and they just need to do what's necessary to run their businesses, and they shouldn't worry a lick about the perception out there. If a if a competitor is going to misuse information, they're going to make stuff up and misuse it. It's just not anything to worry about. And I wish it wasn't so central in principal's minds because it really keeps them from doing the right thing. You know, th- that's interesting. I can think of a few agency principals I know who have been in tough times financially and they've picked up the phone and they've called their um, best clients or former clients and mm-hmm. kind of put the cards on the table and say, say um, hey, we're going through a bit of a rough patch right now. I could use whatever work you can throw our way. And I think that's just so honest and vulnerable and people are, yeah. you know, people really appreciate when you show your vulnerability and good clients, those kind of relationship buyers who are, who, you know, value you being there for the long term, whether they're working with you now or not, they'll, if they can step up and help, they'll step up and help. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right. This is a fantastic list. I'm sure there are what are one or two of the things that maybe didn't make the top five that you might want to throw in and talk about <laughs> things. What other things keep agency principals up at night? Oh, I think, you know, if they have a client concentration problem, in other words, they've got one client who represents too much of their business. Uh, it's interesting because some principals sleep fine at night. Those are the ones that have managed a client concentration problem all their lives. And when they lose one client, they find another one mysteriously. And then the other half of the principals are terrified. And I'd be in that camp, I think. I didn't even have that on my list. But that's uh, that's something that definitely keeps them up at night. Um, and, you know, it's kind of related to this last one, too, you know, like doing the right thing and hanging on. And, you know, related to that, it's like, oh, I hate to lose this team. That's another fear they have. It took me so long to build this yeah. team. And I, you know, I just don't understand that at all. I mean, I do understand it intellectually, but it's like, really? you? And so I, what I help them think about at that point is, okay, do you want to give them a month of severance or do you want to hang on another month and then give them no severance, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Interesting when you pose the question that way. All right. This has been really helpful. And again, I'm sure there's um, all kinds of other things that keep business owners and agency principals in particular up at night. Those are five big ones. Thank you so much for this, Dave. Yeah, you're welcome. Talk to you later, Blair. Bye-bye.